Last time we covered the epic sequel to the original game, Mortal Kombat 2, and its impact on the series, as a much bigger and better Mortal Kombat, what the first game wanted to be, and I also covered the secret warrior hiding within the shadows of the living forest, the gray palette swap ninja, the Lin Kuei and best friend of Kwai Liang, Smoke. From his transformation into a cyborg murder machine, to an alternate history where it was prevented, and his future that keeps him in human form. Today I'll be covering the history of Mortal Kombat Deadly Alliance, the fifth main entry in the series, and the game that fully ushered in what fans know as the 3D era of Mortal Kombat. Then I'll be covering a warrior that was first introduced in Deadly Alliance, known for defending the people of Outworld, a combatant that hasn't been in many entries but has generated excitement with her return in Mortal Kombat 1, Li Mei. The people of Outworld have a defender of their own with Li Mei, and you can have one of your own to keep you safe online with the sponsor of this video, Surfshark VPN. We live in a digital age where we're all becoming more connected to each other. It's important to stay safe and protect yourself with a high quality VPN, and purchasing a 24 month plan is one of the best options Surfshark is offering right now. They were kind enough to give my viewers 3 months extra for free. If you've been on this channel for a while, you may remember when it was hijacked by hackers a couple years ago. After so much effort and time spent on my content, it could have easily been the end of my channel. It was a scary time and it can happen to anybody, and you never think it could be you until it is. Had I been using Surfshark then, I would have been protected. Especially since I livestream regularly, content creators like myself are at a higher risk of DDoS attacks and swatting. Surfshark VPN keeps your connection safe in many ways, including hiding your true location so you're in stealth mode while online. Your online activity and data is encrypted, kept private and secure. It's really easy to use too. You load up Surfshark, you click on Quick Connect, and you're good to go. Protected. Aside from safety and security, Surfshark can provide a lot of fun too. Years ago I saw this crazy Japanese movie on Netflix. They don't have it anymore, and they've removed a ton of foreign films over time that they used to have. I wanted to see if there was any other craziness being produced in Japan right now. So I opened up Surfshark, changed my location to Japan, and I'm inside Netflix Japan. I've discovered a treasure trove of content not available in the US. A ton of anime, Japanese horror, there's a bunch of other countries available too that you can explore. It's great for streaming content from other countries or vice versa if you're traveling abroad and want to access content from home. And what makes Surfshark special? One Surfshark account can be used across unlimited devices, you get 24-7 support, and they don't collect your data. There's a 30 day money back guarantee so it's also risk free. Head on over to Surfshark.com to try it out, click the link in my description below, or you can scan the QR code on the screen to start traveling the cyber highway safely. And make sure to use my promo code GAMERTHUM, all caps, to save some money. Supporting Surfshark VPN also supports this channel. Now back to the history of Mortal Kombat Deadly Alliance and Lee Mei, Defender of Outworld. Lee <laughs> Mei wins. Fatality. Let's use Kronika's Hourglass and go back a couple decades within our own timeline here in Earthrealm. It was the early 2000s. Mortal Kombat 4 had just thrust the series into a semi-3D world. It still mostly played as a 2D game, but with 3D graphics, it dipped its toes into the future of 3D fighters, and it introduced full video endings to the series. Video endings that were of mixed quality. This is not a brutality. This is a fatality. <laughs> Speaking of mixed quality, the long-lasting success of Mortal Kombat during this time was at risk of growing stale. Although Mortal Kombat 4 released generally good reviews and performed well, minus the horrible Game Boy Color version. If you haven't seen my review on it, check it out. It's pretty shocking. You just have to see it. The series did have some messy releases alongside the main fighting entries. Mortal Kombat Mythology Sub-Zero attempted to bring side stories from the universe out of the fighting genre. Although I absolutely adore this game, it's a guilty pleasure of mine. It's not generally looked upon finally as a quality game. Mortal Kombat Special Forces was another huge mess of a game that was destined to bomb. On the live action front, the sequel movie Mortal Kombat Annihilation underperformed and it was panned by critics. The Mortal Kombat Conquest live action series lasted only one season. Perhaps Mortal Kombat had run its course, perhaps it gotten too big for its own good. Maybe it needed to scale back a bit to avoid overexposure to the masses. The time was coming for Mortal Kombat to evolve into the future with the changing taste of the gamers that grew up with it. Work on Mortal Kombat 5 began in early 1998. The plan was to develop the sequel to Mortal Kombat 4 for Midway's new arcade hardware. 
Mortal Kombat 4 was developed using the Zeus 3D chip, and its successor was the more powerful Zeus 2. But Mortal Kombat 5 was never developed for it. Instead, only two games ended up using the Zeus 2 hardware, Cruise and Exotica and the Grid arcade cabinets. After Midway's release of the Grid, they read the writing on the wall. It would be their final arcade game release. The arcade industry in the United States was quickly dying out. The era of kids rushing to the arcade at the local mall after school and spending hours playing games while their parents shopped was over. In some areas, it was a miracle if you can even find an arcade still. Players had better internet connectivity than ever before in the home as online gaming was becoming more common. You could play with friends and chat through a headset while staying in the comfort of your own home. Something that's part of everyday life for the generations here in 2023, but in the early 2000s, it was revolutionary. Home consoles had established themselves as powerhouses of the gaming industry. Players were seeing less reason to go to an arcade and spend quarters playing games, some that they might have had at home already via re-releases or emulation. And so the plans for Mortal Kombat 5's arcade release was scrapped. The next main entry in the Mortal Kombat series would be the first home console exclusive entry. Now, you may have noted that there's a Deadly Alliance arcade cabinet seen in the background of Mortal Kombat 11's arcade stage. It's not real doesn't actually exist, but it's really cool to see that. Mortal Kombat 5 took a bold, high-risk approach. It was setting out to reinvent everything that players had been comfortable and accustomed with since 1992. One of its biggest changes was the story. From Mortal Kombat 1 through 4, the plot was mostly the same idea. A new threat arises, Liu Kang saves the day. This time, however, the main hero of Mortal Kombat was removed. They killed Liu Kang off. I still remember staring in shock at my old CRT TV while Liu Kang had his neck broken. Did that really just happen? No way. It did. Shang Tsung and Quan Chi joined forces as a deadly alliance, hence the name of the game, Mortal Kombat Deadly Alliance. And they discover an immortal army they can use to conquer the realms. Quite a different storyline than previous games and further moving away from the tournament setting to merge the realms. But the most drastic change apart from the overall setting and story was the gameplay. The gameplay was a complete reboot of the series that's unrecognizable going from Mortal Kombat 4 to Deadly Alliance. From the beginning of the series until 4, all the combatants really fought the same, with most differences between characters coming down to their special moves and appearance, versus having individual combat styles. The combat system in Deadly Alliance made each character feel different to handle. Every combatant had specific combos, they could move in the background and foreground of a fully 3D environment, similar to fighters like Tekken and Soul Calibur, and combatants could even use their own weapons. Both features expanded on from their very basic and limited introductions in Mortal Kombat 4. To switch between two unique martial arts styles and the use of a weapon, players just had to push a single button in the middle of combat. There was also a power-up function, which allowed attacks to be stronger briefly, and the use of real digitized actors was long gone. Instead, combatants were 3D models in a much higher quality than Mortal Kombat 4. Saying the amount of changes to the Mortal Kombat formula were vast is an understatement. Every stage was brand new arena, there were zero returning stages from previous games. Deadly Alliance could have been a whole new fighting game series. Though it did successfully retain the feel of the Mortal Kombat universe, it still had its identity, it was just different and new. And not having an arcade release, which was typically a quick arcade mode and a character ending, allowed for Midway to really make Deadly Alliance feel right at home on consoles. It was filled to the brim with content. Aside from your typical arcade mode with character endings, Deadly Alliance also included minigames, reintroducing Test Your Might from the original Mortal Kombat, and new minigame where you had to keep track of moving object before attempting to choose the right one. Playing throughout the game in these minigames are new combat coins that you can use to unlock content in what would become a staple of the series from that point forward, the Crypt. In Deadly Alliance, it was a room filled with coffins, each with different values required to unlock them. And this is where Deadly Alliance really shines in the replayability department. The unlockables ranged from unlockable characters, artwork, making of content, alternate costumes that aren't just palette swaps, the list goes on. But most importantly, Cooking with Scorpion. This week on Cooking with Scorpion, learn about chopping, tenderizing, chopping, cake decorating, and chopping! 
And finally, Deadly Alliance included a brand new conquest mode that sent the player on various training missions to learn all the character combos and it fleshed out the storyline details of the universe. With all of these changes and additions into the game, inevitably that meant that much stuff ended up on the cutting room floor. Players used to multiple fatalities, fatalities, animalities, friendships, would be disappointed to find out that only fatalities made their return. And on top of that, combatants only had one fatality each, no stage fatalities. Except the characters of Blaze and Mocap who had no fatalities programmed in at all. Several characters were also designed and cut from the game. Liu Kang, Shaolin Monk student Kai, introduced in Mortal Kombat 4, didn't make the cut. Dairu was originally planned for Deadly Alliance and ended up in the sequel, Deception. Shao Kahn, although he was at the time killed in the intro cutscene, would have been playable and new combatants we still haven't seen to this day. A brand new, fully lizard-like creature called Tiamat became the new appearance of Reptile. The character of Baphomet would have been part of a new race known as Elder Demons. And a female combatant known as Sioban was being designed as a companion piece to Lee Mei, but she was also left out. Even with these cuts in place, Deadly Alliance brought forth a whole new generation of combatants whose reception to this day is mostly mixed. Some of them were bottom-of-the-barrel creations like the now legendary Su Hao. <laughs> Others like Kenshi became extremely popular and still shine as returning combatants throughout the years. And new lore was added to flesh out other characters like the brand new Red Dragon Clan gave us more backstory into the origins of the Black Dragon Clan. But what would the fanbase think of this new Mortal Kombat? Would they embrace it? Or would this be the death nail of an aging series that overstayed its welcome with one too many games? E3 2001. The very first trailer for Deadly Alliance was shown with no gameplay and only a brief announcement that a new Mortal Kombat was on its way. But in E3 2002, players got their first look at Scorpion in the new trailer. And I remember getting in trouble all the time in my high school computer class over this trailer. I watched it and rewatched it so many times in the classroom when I was supposed to be doing my work. Like many other fans my age, I was over the top excited for a new Mortal Kombat entry. And at E3 2002, players were also able to experience the game firsthand with a playable prototype. And you can see in this footage here, it was still early since Kenshi was still labeled as Blind Kenshi, something that wasn't in the final release of the game. Game. If you ask players today, the combat style of the 3D era of Mortal Kombat receives fairly mixed opinions, but regardless, Deadly Alliance accomplished what it set out to do. It successfully rebooted the gameplay and breathed new life into the series, at least long enough to ensure that we'd get enough sequels to get to where we are now. On November 22, 2002, North American players spoke with their wallets. Reviews were mostly positive, the best reviews Mortal Kombat game had gotten since Mortal Kombat 2. They praised the reinvention of the Mortal Kombat formula, its deeper combo system, and its successful transition fully into 3D. In its first month after release, Deadly Alliance sold more than 1 million copies, and eventually more than doubled that figure. Aside from the home console version, Deadly Alliance even made its way home into the portable console gaming market, with the Game Boy Advance release of Deadly Alliance. Obviously a much more limited experience, but it was also followed by another tournament edition of the game, adding more characters like Sektor and Serena, who hadn't been in a Mortal Kombat game outside of Mythology's Sub-Zero. Players embraced this new era of 3D combat and gave its characters a chance to shine. One of those new characters was the combatant known as Lee Mei. Lee Mei. Players were used to Outworld being depicted as the savage realm, filled with four-armed dragon people and sharp blade-wielding monsters. It was rare when its citizens weren't depicted as weird evil beings. But Li Mei was designed as an ordinary appearing young woman, native to a small village in Outworld, quite different from the vicious way the denizens of Outworld are usually represented as. She went through several designs with Asian-inspired clothing until her final look settled on a purple outfit, and her unlockable alternate outfit, of course the obligatory half-naked exotic dancer appearance. She debuts in Mortal Kombat Deadly Alliance equipped with two martial arts styles, her weapons were Sai much like Melina, and she could shoot a purple ball of energy known as her sparkler. To understand to understand Lee Mei's story and her contributions to Mortal Kombat lore, we have to go back to the end of Mortal Kombat 4. Scorpion had just discovered that the evil sorcerer Quan Chi was the true mastermind behind the death of his family. When Scorpion discovered this dark truth, he attacked Quan Chi in a rage and transported him to one of the deepest depths of the Nether Realm, the Fifth Plane. Never! In the 
fifth plane of the nether realm, Quan Chi had no power, and it was infinite in size. He was now in Scorpion's realm. Quan Chi spent what felt like an eternity running from Scorpion, after facing constant, endless torture. At some point, he was able to escape through a portal leading back to Outworld and made a shocking discovery. An ancient army that belonged to Onaga the Dragon King. Onaga was the first known emperor of Outworld until Shao Kahn poisoned him and took his place as emperor. With his death, Onaga's army ceased to function. It was an immortal army that couldn't be destroyed and powered by souls. When one fell, it would resurrect again. Quan Chi devised a plot to resurrect the army with the assistance of Shang Tsung. The two sorcerers entered into an agreement to work together and use Onaga's army to rule the realms. First, they would start with the takeover of Outworld, but to begin their plan, they had to remove their two biggest obstacles. They traveled Earthrealm and killed Liu Kang in a surprise attack, and visited the weakened Shao Kahn after his defeat at Liu Kang's hands, and together destroyed the Emperor, secretly a clone of Shao Kahn while the original was recovering. Outworld was ready for the taking, and the Deadly Alliance would need a location to build their fortress where Onaga's army would be resurrected by feeding them with souls. The chosen site was near the Outworld village of Sun Do. The villagers of Sun Do saw the area as sacred since an ancient stone structure was located there. Their local legend said the structure contained a portal to the heavens that was left by the gods. Shang Tsung and Quan Chi had no respect for the sacred nature of Sun Do. Instead, they hired the Black Dragon Kano to be their enforcer, and under their command, Kano and his forces enslaved the people of Sun Do. The villagers were forced to work in a construction camp and built Shang Tsung and Quan Chi a great palace, under horrific conditions. Inside the palace, Quan Chi used Shinnok's amulet to open the legendary portal in the stone structure. He used the portal to access a countless swarm of souls that had been trapped in a void between the realms for eons. These souls were transplanted one by one to awaken each soldier in Onaga's army. One villager, Li Mei, witnessed the abuse of her people and the threat posed by the sorcerers, and she decided to stand up for the people of Outworld. Li Mei attacked Kano ferociously and defeated him in combat. <laughs> Quan Chi witnessed the attack on Kano and did nothing to stop it. He was mostly amused as Li Mei stood victoriously, and he made her an offer that she couldn't refuse. They would hold a Mortal Kombat tournament of their own, and if Li Mei entered and won, she and her people would be freed. If she failed, their enslavement would be never-ending. Li Mei agreed to the terms. Before the tournament began, she encountered Shujinko, a man unknowingly on a quest that would end with the resurrection of the Dragon King Onaga himself. She revealed that she was secretly planning to attack Quan Chi and Shang Tsung. Shujinko advised against it, but still provided some light training to prepare her. You are not from this town. Who are you? Why have you been enslaved here? I am Shujinko. I am from Earthrealm, on a quest for the Elder Gods. I have been instructed to return to Outworld to confront a growing threat here. I seem to have found it. I am Li Mei. My village was the first conquest of the Deadly Alliance. They have enslaved my people. For this, I will kill them in due time. What is your plan of attack? The Deadly Alliance have offered to free my village if I win their combat tournament. I have accepted their challenge, but I intend to use the tournament as a way to get closer to them. I will attack when they least expect it. Bold words, young one, but perhaps a bit foolish. What makes you think you can defeat them both? I will concede that I am not ready to confront them yet, for I desperately need additional training. Perhaps I may be of some help. Over the years I have absorbed much combat skill. Then you must teach me, Shujinko. Help me to save my people from oppression. I will teach you what I can, Li Mei, but I do not approve of your intention to combat the two sorcerers alone. I believe that course of action will end in misfortune. Thank you for your training, Master Shujinko. Please accept this token of my appreciation. I thank you for the gift, Li Mei. Perhaps your confrontation with the sorcerers is not necessary. I know of someone who might help to free your village. His name is Hotaru. He once saved the walled city of Lei Chen from the Tarkatan hordes. I will journey there and ask for his assistance. If you think he can drive out the Deadly Alliance, then by all means, find this Hotaru and tell him of our plight. I will do my best to convince him to help. The guards are watching. I must not draw their attention if I am to escape your village. Goodbye, Li Mei. Li Mei entered the tournament and fought to the very end. She won, but never got the chance to attack the sorcerers. In her partially canon Mortal Kombat Deadly Alliance ending, Li Mei experienced a tragic betrayal and learned how unreliable the promises of an evil sorcerer actually were. Her people would be used to power Onaga's army, and so would she.
Li Mei had been promised that her people would be freed from enslavement if she could win the tournament held by the Deadly Alliance. Now that she had emerged victorious, the true purpose behind the tournament was finally revealed to her. Her soul would be the last one Shang Tsung needed to completely revive the Dragon King's lost army. Her people would never be freed, and Li Mei herself would remain trapped inside the mummified remains of a dead soldier, cursed to serve the Deadly Alliance forever. Li Mei's soul was used to finish Awakening on Ai's army, but in the canon version of events, she wasn't trapped inside one of their bodies for long. The outworld martial arts master that helped train Liu Kang, Master Bo Raicho, entered the sorcerer's palace while Li Mei's soul was being transferred, and he was successfully able to rescue her and escape before the process was complete. They were chased by the Tarkatan forces working for the Deadly Alliance, and escaped just as Raiden and his Earthrealm heroes arrived to fight them. Li Mei's soul had returned to her body, and she recovered slowly as Bo Raicho nursed her back to health. She was forever grateful to the master. When she was back in full health, Li Mei and Boraicho learned what happened after their escape. Onaga the Dragon King had resurrected and withstood the combined attack from Raiden, Shang Tsung, and Quan Chi, enemies forced to work together to overcome this greater threat. Raiden's warriors were all killed, resurrected and enslaved by the Dragon King, and Onaga now wielded Shinnok's amulet. The attack failed to stop the Dragon King. A new threat faced not just Outworld, but all the realms now. Onaga was seeking to merge every realm and sit on the throne as the Emperor of Everything by using the power of the Kamidogu. Six relics spread across the realms that could be fused with Shinnok's amulet. Fusing the Kamidogu into one would allow Onaga to change all of reality as he saw fit. During the events of Mortal Kombat Deception, Li Mei returns. Although Bo Raicho had saved her from being completely absorbed within one of Onaga's soldiers, her brief time inside one of the bodies left her changed when she returned. Such close contact with one of Onaga's weapons imprinted aspects of his army within her, and she felt somewhat drawn to the Dragon King. Instead of her traditional Sun Do village clothing, she now donned battle armor and a much more warlike attitude. Shijinko gathered an alliance to fight back against the Dragon King he unintentionally resurrected, and Li Mei joined the warriors in combat. The closer Li Mei was to Onaga, the stronger his hold over her became, as if she were already part of his army. In her non-canon Mortal Kombat deception ending, Li Mei turned against her allies and guaranteed Onaga's success. An alliance had been formed of warriors from vastly different origins, but with a similar goal, to defeat Onaga. Li Mei marched uneasily into battle against the Dragon King. The closer she got to him, the more she came to understand which side was truly deserving of victory. Li Mei turned on her former allies and gave her emperor the time he needed to finish merging the Kami Dogu. The Dragon King was now all-powerful. He had the means to control the universe, to make and unmake as he saw fit. Li Mei watched in delight as the Elder Gods fled before his might. Onaga then transformed her into his queen to be forever at his side. He had given her power beyond anything she ever imagined. Together, they will rule the One Realm and slay the last of the Elder Gods. In the canon version of events, Li Mei didn't get to betray her allies before Shijinko defeated Onaga and ended the threat of the Dragon King. But he wouldn't be the final threat to all of reality. Years of combat were threatening to unravel all the realms, and a multi-realm Armageddon was coming. The only way to stop it was to defeat the Flame Elemental Blaze and claim its power to affect reality. And the Half-God Taven set out on a quest to stop Armageddon. He encountered a version of Li Mei in the Nether Realm. Is that Shinnok? Why is an Elder God here in the Nether Realm? It seems as though he needs help. How the mighty have fallen! This day is ours! Die, Shinnok! Taven! Where did you come from? I am weakened, son of Argus! You must protect me! Step away from Lord Shinnok! Now! You will pay for your interference! Your assistance could not have come at a better time. You defended me against the She-Devil Li Mei, and for that, I am forever grateful. I don't understand. Why did you need my help, Lord Shinnok? You are an Elder God. 
It appeared that she was attacking the Elder God of Death, Shinnok. In reality, she was simply an illusion created by the Elder God, Drataven's attention. Eventually, Shinnok gathered an army to claim the power of Blades, and so did the Forces of Light seeking to stop him. Li Mei fought for the Forces of Light. In her non-canon Armageddon ending, Li Mei defeated Blades and used its power to take her ultimate revenge against Quan Chi and Shang Tsung for what they did to her people. Filled with the energy of Blaze, Li Mei had but one purpose for her newfound power. In retribution for slaying her people, she banished the souls of Quan Chi and Shang Tsung to an obelisk. Trapped inside the relic, they must fend off wave after wave of aggressors for eternity. Justice has finally been done. Armageddon was the last time pre-Mortal Kombat 1 that Li Mei was playable. Shao Kahn claimed the power of Blaze, and Raiden sent a message to his younger self to prevent this new dark future. In this new altered history, after Liu Kang's defeat of Shao Kahn, Outworld was in disarray. His ex-general Kotal took over as the new Khan, and Melina led a rebellion against his rule. She claimed to be the rightful heir of the throne. In her efforts to claim the throne of Outworld, Melina gained possession of Shinnok's amulet, and was using it to indiscriminately wipe out any opposition, although she didn't have full control over the amulet. One of the victims of Melina's attacks were the villagers of Sundo. Civilians all across Outworld were traveling to Earthrealm and seeking asylum as refugees and the special forces led by Sonya Blade helped organize and process the incoming refugees. Li Mei was among the number of Outworlders seeking a new home, and she had intel on one of Sonya's most notorious enemies. This is Li Mei. She seeks asylum for her people in Earthrealm. Our village, Sando, was the epicenter of a fierce battle. We barely escaped with our lives. Such is war. I mean, no offense, but... You outworlders kind of live for that, right? This was different. The rebels, Melina, had a weapon unlike anything. Entire battalions erased. It was not honorable, not combat. Tell me more about the weapon. A talisman, gold, with a center jewel. Melina wields its crimson energy without precision. It is enough that she possesses it. It turns the tide in her favor. The Emperor grows desperate, and those caught in the middle pay the price. If this talisman is what I suspect it to be, we may all pay a price. We talking about Shinnok's amulet? Can't be. The base, the vault, your warnings. SF, Shaolin, no way anyone can get past all that. I must be certain. Well, this is cozy. You remind me of an Earthrealmer who crossed over with us. He also found humor in everything. Handsome guy, right? He was an Earthrealmer. One of his eyes glowed red. What does she mean? Name. Ray M. A. Two K. E. Ray. Thanks. All right. You seem to know this Kano intimately. Not the word I'd use, but yes. I chased him for years until he escaped to Outworld after Shinnok's invasion. Caught. Gotcha. Thanks to Li Mei's information, Sonya was able to track down Kano hiding in the camp and captured him. After the defeat of Shinnok and the end of the Civil War in Outworld, it's unknown whether Li Mei stayed in Earthrealm or returned home to Sundo in Outworld. She wasn't involved in the events of Mortal Kombat 11, but her life was one of the many affected by the now Fire God Liu Kang and his creation of a new era. He reverted time back to its beginning and crafted a new history for the realms, resulting in drastic changes across all of reality. In Liu Kang's new era, Li Mei returns in a new role with a new history. Since she was her parents' firstborn daughter, she was taken in by a group known as the Umgadi and trained as a warrior priestess dedicated to protecting Outworld's royal family. In her early years as part of the Umgadi, 
Scotty, Li Mei's skills excelled, and she caught the eye of the royal family. But tragedy eventually struck. Under her watch, King Jared was killed. Li Mei had failed in her mission and quit the Ungadi in shame. Many placed the blame on her shoulders. She found herself friendless and alone, but she found a new purpose as part of Sundo's constables, their local police force. Li Mei was Sundo's capital guardian, but still hoped to one day redeem herself over Jared's death. And that is the history of Mortal Kombat Deadly Alliance and Li Mei, defender of Outworld as of now. Are you excited to see Li Mei back in Mortal Kombat 1? And what role would you like her to play in the future of the series? And thank you to my friends at Surfshark VPN for sponsoring this video. Remember to click the link below to try it out and save yourself some money with code GAMERTHUM, all caps. I am still Umgadi. I will always honor my vows. Yeah!